Can we start? Yes, sure. Okay. Do you have the microphone turning? I can turn it on. Can turn it on now? Yes, I think. Okay. Because your position is good. Yeah. Okay. And everything's okay? Mm -hmm. Buenos días, vamos a comenzar este, ya nuestro cuarto día eh, de congreso y vamos a comenzar con esta ponencia magistral que nos va a titular la conservación y restauración de papeles transparentes y está a cargo de la maestra Lois Pueblo Parais que nos acompaña de la Universidad de Delaware en los Estados Unidos es directora del área de conservación y bueno, es especialista obviamente en conservación de este tipo de papeles Thank you all very much. I feel very happy and very welcome to be here. I'd like to thank the three organizing institutions who put together this first ever Congress on the conservation of documents. I know how much work it has been to bring all of us together, and I appreciate it very much. Before I begin on the, the topic of my, can everyone hear okay? Yes? Before I be, no? Before I begin on the topic of my talk, which is transparent papers, um, which I've entitled uh, Transparently Important and found almost everywhere, as the uh, conservators who have been working with me in a workshop all week know. I wanted to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about um, where I work and come from in hopes that you at someday will come and visit us. Um, I am the Director of Conservation at the Winneter Museum in Delaware, uh, where I also teach in the Winneter University of Delaware program in art conservation. And Winneter is located in the beautiful Brandywine Valley. And it began life in the early 19th century as a DuPont family home. Uh, as in the DuPont Chemical Company, this is the family. Uh, Henry Francis DuPont grew up at Winneter, and he returned home as a young man to manage the estate, which became his life work. In 1930, he tripled the size of the house to accommodate his rapidly growing collection of American art and decorative arts and began planning for its eventual transformation to a public institution. And he accomplished this goal in 1951 to, in his words, help show modern Americans how early Americans had lived. He left a remarkable collection of some 90,000 objects made or used in America between 16 40 and 1860. 
So needless to say, there are lots and lots of European objects, as well as Americans, since so much was imported. He actively developed Winnetur as a fully sustainable agricultural enterprise, best known for its dairy cattle, uh, something people don't think about being at museums, but we have them. And almost a thousand acres of gardens, parks, meadows, woods, and farmland. Today, Winnetur's collection of decorative and fine arts remains one of the best in the U.S., and the objects are displayed in 175 museum rooms and settings, and in <clears throat> museum galleries of about 35,000 square feet. The collections include furniture, architectural elements. He took whole rooms and interiors from important houses. Remember, this was happening during the Depression when people needed money very badly when he was building his collection. Textiles, paintings, metals, ceramics, glass, and works of art on paper. In partnership with the University of Delaware, he founded Winnetur's first graduate program in American material culture in 1952 and envisioned the second graduate program in art conservation, where I teach, in 1974. So the students in this program work in classrooms and laboratories in the Louise DuPont Crown and Shield Research Building, named after Mr. DuPont's sister, it was de dedicated in May 1969 just one month after his death. The building houses an extensive research library to which there are paid fellowships for conservators as well as other scholars. It includes a comprehensive collection of conservation literature amongst many, many, many other resources for the study of material culture. The top two levels of the four-story building house the conservation studios and a scientific research and analysis laboratory, which was an extraordinarily visionary thing to establish at that time in U.S. museums. So I'd also like to say we're very proud of our graduate students in our conservation who earn a Master of Science degree over a course of three years. And I would like to congratulate you all on the opening of your new master's program. Fernanda has been telling me about it. The slides I'm showing you in the background show some of our students and the things they've worked on over the last few years, from a bitumen funeral boat from Ur to C-3PO from Star Wars, two large murals and a Damascene ceiling to an Apollo space suit and George Washington saddlebags. As you know, art conservation actually deals with many materials and issues that are not normally thought of as art. We think of art as paintings, prints, tapestries, porcelain. But, of course, conservators work with these materials, but they also work with human skeletal remains of indigenous peoples, natural history specimens and jars, historic adobe structures in the southwest, digitization programs for brittle books, waterlogged wood excavated from marine archaeological sites, rock paintings by Aboriginal peoples in Australia, and of course, some students specialize in paper, photographs, books, and library materials, bringing us to the subject of this talk. So I hope <clears throat> that if you find yourself in the area of Philadelphia or Washington, D.C., we are a short train ride, and we would love to have you visit. So, now we turn to the rather amazing world of transparent papers. So these light to medium weight papers are also called, maybe called tracing papers, but of course this just describes their function. And it's only one function of this really rather extraordinary class of papers. They were used for a wide variety of purposes, most of which take advantage of their primary property, the ability to transmit light with minimal interference so we can see what lies behind. Printmakers commonly use these papers to transfer designs from paper to the printing plate or the lithographic stone. And printmakers have taken advantage of the paper's very smooth surface to pull prints of great detail and clarity, often as sheen collet prints 
like this one, uh, where the thin transparent paper rests on top of a soft thick paper to which it's adhered during the printing process. And in this one, the mouse is actually on the transparent paper, and his shadow has been printed on the paper below. Makers of transfer printed ceramics have used transparent papers since the early 19th century to print designs in colored ceramic glazes that are then transferred to the ceramic body before firing. So this thin, smooth, translucent nature of the paper allows these highly detailed designs to be accurately registered and applied to the ceramic surface. Pattern makers for clothing, embroidery, and yes, tattoos uh, use transparent papers to create easily transferable designs. Like the previous example, the original is usually destroyed in the transfer process. Uh, so the paucity of surviving examples of transparent papers at many periods can actually be misleading in assessing how common they were at any given period. They almost always have been ephemeral, a temporary use and then discarded. These papers that we see before us clearly were also used for tracing, but the traced image was often intended for transfer to another medium by one of several methods. Retracing was common, leaving evidence such as graphite or pigment smeared on the verso, you see here, or incised lines that create additional conservation challenges, in this case, of course, along with the iron gall ink. Another widely practiced form of copying was in letterpress books, where an original letter, either handwritten or typed, in the 20th century was dampened and placed behind a sheet of transparent paper in a letterpress book and then left in a press overnight to transfer the image to the back of the sheet. Then it can be read right way around from the front through the transparent paper. This was common practice in most business offices from the early 19th through the first part of the 20th century when photocopies became common. And in this case, they've actually used a letterpress book to trace patterns for lace. The other alternative, of course, once typewriters were common, was the use of carbon paper to make copies. You all are young. You probably don't remember the joys of typing through carbon paper. Uh, but of course, the carbon paper transferred its image to a thin, transparent paper known as onion skin. Anybody who works in archives where there are lots of 20th century material will be quite familiar with them. The inks used for letterpress copying, formulations of iron gold ink, or later inks with aniline dyes, of course pose still another conservation challenge. And of course, we find transparent papers in printed books where they were used for interleaving illustrations and where as in this case where they've printed um, a caption, uh, they form an integral part of the design. They could also be folded up and inserted in books as printed designs and maps. In the case of architectural plans, uh, which you see here in a trade catalog, where they've actually used two kinds of transparent papers of varying degrees of discoloration and brittleness. And they were used in these instances, not as much because they were transparent, but because they were very thin and saved space within the binding structure. Once manufacturers about the middle of the 19th century discovered how to produce a paper that resembled parchment, properly called vegetable parchment, new applications emerged, and we find printed dip diplomas and certificates of all kinds where the transparency of the paper was not that critical to the function, but the paper's resemblance to parchment was the main point of the exercise. Since the paper was also greaseproof and water resistant, it was also heavily used for food packaging. And we can say, ah, we're conservators, we won't have to deal with this. However, Early or nostalgic printed examples are now for sale, such as these popsicle ice cream popsicle wrappers on eBay. Not all that cheap, and will soon be found if they're not there already, in collections of popular history and advertising ephemera. So there's no escape. 
Calligraphers have also taken advantage of this parchment-like resemblance to use transparent papers for everything from fine illuminated books to wedding invitations, um, theater programs, and restaurant menus. Again, part of our popular history and advertising ephemera collections. And artists, contemporary artists, have also found the surface offered by some transparent papers a really attractive fit for their needs and their aesthetic, where the paper actually is the final support rather than a means of tracing or transfer. And then finally, last but hardly least, we find the most familiar application for transparent papers where they have survived in great quantity, architectural, engineering, and design drawings. They've been used by architects and designers for centuries to copy or transfer designs. By the 20th century, they often had become primary support for the design, not necessarily traced. But much of what we value these tracing sketches and find, but much as we value these tracings and renderings, it's important to remember that the architects and engineers who made them generally did not. Drawings were seen as unimportant, a means to an end. Getting the commission for the building or the bridge was the important part to a professional architect or engineer, not the drawing. Even the most beautiful rendering was no more than a sales document to most. Since drawings were only a mean to, means to an end, architects and drafters took full advantage of any technology that would speed the process, even if it sacrificed durability. Time is money. Or if it would produce a more alluring sales document. You can't build the bridge or the building if nobody will commission you to design it and pay for the construction. So long-term durability was seldom an issue. The drawings and the paper on they were done on often were ephemeral, and if not discarded at the end of a project, they were tightly rolled or folded and stuffed into files in attics, basements, or storerooms. This may explain why we find so many in such deplorable condition. So while architects and builders have used tracing paper for centuries, it did not become a critical element of the construction process until the 19th. Before this time, most builders did not rely heavily on design drawings if they existed at all. Early American drawings, and I suspect this may be true in Mexico as well, were executed by master builders, and they were composed of you know, uniformly inked ruled lines, generally done to a small scale with very little detail. This may be all you had if you were building a house. Decisions like the profile of moldings, the trim around windows, the design of decorative brickwork were left to the discretion of the builder or decisions made during the construction process through informal consultation. The abbreviated design process was possible because of the nature of 18th and early 19th century aesthetic assumptions, everybody shared the same ones, and building practices. Construction technology was very traditional for all types of structures and was based on building practices well known and understood by all concerned. So they required little explanation and few drawings. By 1830, um, with the emergence of the architectural profession, many of whom began their life as master builders and then took courses and studied um, independently to become architects, Fewer decisions were left to the discretion of the builder and related craftsmen. So in addition to making presentation drawings to convince the client, architects began to execute more detailed construction drawings for the builder that might include framing, window sashes, heating and ventilation systems, and other functional and decorative elements. So increasingly they needed copies in the office and copies on the building site to provide this kind of instruction in detail. So we arrive at making copies. The most common early copying processes used until the widespread introduction of tracing paper after the mid-19th century was pricking the design. The master drawing, the original, was laid over a blank sheet and a needle like this 
was used to mark the major elements, which were then connected with ruled lines to reproduce the original. So we see here a drawing that has been pricked through to the sheet below. And then in raking light, you could see all of those little pricks and connect the lines to make a copy. Um, pretty laborious. Another alternative was the use of a stylus and a coated transfer paper <clears throat> uh, to transfer the image, sort of like carbon paper, to another support. And so we see advertisements for this agate stylus in various colors of uh, transparent or transfer paper, usually a wax pigment concoction applied to the paper. Of course, you could also use dividers to transfer dimensions. But what became the most common and preferred means of copying was the use of tracing papers um, in order to transfer the design to a transparent support. So this led to the further development of tracing papers and their much dirtier cousins, as we'll see, tracing cloths. Traditionally, tracing paper had been a thin paper, although actually any paper can be used. It's impregnated with an oil or resin to render it translucent was available from stationers and artist supplies by the early decades of the 19th century when French pa tracing papers such as the Delon, you see the watermark here, this is actually a later version, but it's a name still with us and part of the Canson Montgolfier uh, family of papers, was considered superior. You see we're advertising the finest French vegetable tracing paper. And I should pause here and say as we go through, you'll see lots of images from trade catalogs. And I found these to be absolutely invaluable resources in understanding what products were being marketed to the architectural and engineering communities at what time, when they were introduced, when they disappeared from catalogs, what their relative costs were, and which ones they seemed to be um, promoting the most. It really helps to understand the papers you find in the collection when you know what was available at the time. Okay, many manuals, of course, instructed um, practitioners on how to make their own oiled paper, and many of them did. We certainly find lots of evidence um, when they've survived of papers that appear to be very much uh, do-it-yourself. Architects also appear to have used a thin, smoothly surfaced, heavily pressed papers, such as banknote papers or post papers, for tracing and drawing purposes through the first half of the 19th century. These strong translucent sheets were produced to fulfill the needs actually of the financial and legal sectors for thin durable sheets that would withstand repeated handling, folding, and filing. These sheets were not oiled. To this end, the pulp was beaten carefully for a longer time and the sheet was heavily pressed or calendared, resulting in, as a side effect useful to architects and engineers, significant translucency. So we see here a sheet in, um, it looks fairly, relatively opaque, but when we slip something under it, we see that it actually is quite translucent. And this is from a book of samples um, put out in 1855. Tracing cloth, always a British manufacturer until the 20th century in the U.S., began appearing in the 1850s as an expensive but highly durable alternative to paper. While the starch impregnated cotton cloth is certainly not paper, um, it tends to become the responsibility of paper conservators because it was used like paper, and it is always found in paper-based collections. Uh, the drawing dates to 1860, and the trade catalog pages are from the 1930s, and they list more than a dozen varieties of this drafting support. But this material would be the subject of an entire different workshop and conference. As we see architectural design become more business-oriented in the decades after 1860, architecture changed from small practices with an architect and a few journeyman apprentices large offices with business managers, drafters, construction managers, engineers, and other specialized positions. The change reflected the growing size and complexity of the buildings, the number of subcontractors, the planning, and the financing necessary to construct them. 
These are very different from those small vernacular structures we saw 100 years earlier. The number and complexity of the drawings and the copies required to build these buildings increased geometrically, as well as creating a huge bottleneck in the design and construction process. Because, of course, anyone who's been involved in a construction process knows you may create the original set of drawings, but there are always changes that need to be communicated and generally communicated as drawings. The demand was fulfilled by innumerable craftsmen in large cities, often sweatshops of immigrants, who did nothing but trace drawings 12 to 14 hours a day. The results were too often neither quick nor accurate. Uh, so this was a huge bottleneck as we start looking at these large complex buildings. The introduction of the blueprinting process, originally called the ferro prussier or cyanotype process in the late 1870s, revolutionized the production of architectural drawings and significantly affected the practice of architecture by facilitating the coordination of increasingly large and complex projects. Finally, a quick, cheap, accurate way to make copies. This new process spread like wildfire through the engineering and architectural communities. Like the other processes to follow, blueprints are contact printed from an original drawing on a transparent paper or transparent cloth support. The blueprint process was rapidly followed by a myriad of other processes, almost a dozen of which received widespread commercial application. I know we have some photo conservatories here, and of course you are familiar with the incredible innovation, risk-taking, and imagination that characterized the development of photographic processes during this period. And these clever people also applied it to the production of photoreproductive uh, processes. So these processes come in blue, black, brown, lavender, maroon, on every kind of support, paper, tracing paper, tracing cloth. This period was one of intense innovation that resulted in the formation of the repographics industry. This was a whole new industry. And the introduction of uncounted new products related to the photo reproduction of drawings. To give you some sense of the scope of use, by 1900, William Cramp and Sons, they were ship and engine builders in Philadelphia, we're using 11,000 square feet of blueprint paper per ship that they constructed. Remembering that each blueprint was printed from a drawing on a transparent support. That's a lot of tracing paper. It shouldn't be a surprise that we see this explosion in the number and types of papers in our collection in the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century. Okay, printing was accomplished using wooden contact printing frames with plate glass fronts. Originally, they were propped up on the roof of a building or run out of windows on specially constructed tracks. So here we have the original site plan on a tracing cloth, the blueprint that was printed from it. And in a catalog, you could buy these frames and printing uh, contact printing frames to send out your window. So, of course, they were known as solar prints. The ink drawing to be printed, usually referred to as the tracing, was laid directly against the glass with the sensitized paper immediately behind it. Then a felt blanket or rubber sheet was placed behind the paper in the back of the frame, closed securely using one of several mechanisms so you'd have good contact. So here's a frame that could be wheeled out the door. You were seeing it from the back. There we go. You're not pointing well. Okay, well, and then on the bottom you see on the bottom the plate glass, the drawing, the felt, and the closure mechanism. Poor contact in any area would result in a fuzzy print. And you certainly don't want any um, question in the numbers if you're building a structure like a bridge. So having really clear blueprints was important. Very large tracings were copied, wrapping both the tracing and the sensitized paper around a large cylinder, which was placed on a cradle and revolved in the sun, rather like a roast of meat on a spit. 
By 1900, machines that could make blueprints as well as other types of prints using an electric arc lamp rather than the unreliable and inconvenient sun had been introduced. The tracing and sensitized paper were wrapped around the glass cylinder facing inward and an arc lamp was raised and lowered within the cylinder. With the rapidly growing demand for more and faster prints, machines like the one on the right that could expose, wash, and dry blueprints in one continuous operation were in common use by blueprinters by 1920. But many offices continued to maintain their own printing facilities for at least some of their work. So you see it there in this rather idealized view of a drafting office. Frankly, most of them were rather dark. The drafters tended to smoke like chimneys, and they were not um, particularly healthy or attractive places. But of course, this is from a trade catalog, and they're selling the furniture. With the growing variety and availability of transparent papers spurred by blueprinting demands, architects began to find other uses for these papers and executed original sketches and working drawings directly on the supports rather than tracing them from another sheet of more traditional paper. Again, time is money. They liked the surface and used them for developmental sketches and increasingly final renderings and even presentation drawings like the one we see on the lower right which was done on a tracing paper, then adhered to a brittle board, now brittle board. By the opening decades of the 20th century, <clears throat> architects turned increasingly to dry media like pencil, colored pencil, chalk, and charcoal, and the execution of both working and presentation drawings, a practice that greatly reduced the time required when paired with the use of ink and watercolor. Tracing papers as manufacturers developed and refined their properties offered an ideal surface for dry media. In fact, often the size surface would include a very fine abrasive to provide extra tooth and hold for some of these dry media papers. The diazo, or dye line photoreproductive process introduced in the 1920s, would reproduce pencil lines on a transparent support so they no longer had to ink the drawings for reproduction. So this further encouraged the use of dry media on tracing paper. By the opening decades of the 20th century, tracing papers available in many grades and types for every purpose had become the workhorses of most architects' offices. It was not unusual by 1930 for the preliminary and developmental sketches the presentation drawings, and the working drawings, all to be done on different kinds of transparent paper. Typical catalogs listed five, 15 to 20 varieties in a range of costs, weights, surfaces, and degrees of transparency and durability. So in the 20th century, we have important drawings on fine, expensive, often imported transparent papers designed to accept wet as well as dry media. And we have cheap, often poorly made paper known as flimsy or bumwad among architects that was torn off the roll in quantity and used for developmental sketches or any other function where a cheap, readily available paper was needed. So this gives you a thumbnail sketch of tracing paper history from the perspective of American architecture. But the material, of course, has a much, much longer history was first mentioned by Cennini in the Craftsman's Handbook in the 15th century, where he gave instructions for oiling paper to make it transparent for tracing. Before paper, builders and artists used fetal or oil impregnated parchment for tracing and transferring designs, and cast sheets of gelatin for this purpose, which is a really ancient technique, though you also see it listed in 19th century trade catalogs. But oiled paper was by far the most common. Okay, tracing papers can be divided into three, sometimes overlapping and often confusing, I warn you ahead of time, categories based on their manufacturing process and properties. By combining various production techniques, manufacturers sought to balance the often conflicting properties of transparency, durability, erasability, 
dimensional stability, how much it would change, because of course these drawings were done to scale, and if your drawing expands and contracts, that can be a problem. Media receptivity, you don't want it to cockle too much with watercolor or smear with dry media, and cost. Architectural offices were always looking for a bargain. Paper manufacturers developed increasingly specialized types of papers to meet all these different needs. They included papers designed for all types of drawing and rendering applications, as well as tracing and blue printing blueprints. Papers were designed with, for watercolor work and sized with gelatin or starch to reduce the distortion of the paper and provide a surface with the right absorbency. Different colors and tones of paper were also available to ease eye strain or show less dirt when used on the construction site. The three different processes are, as you see before you, an oiled or what is also called a prepared or impregnated paper, um, or what we call vellum, uh, which we see a good deal of now, is descended from this paper. We have natural or beaten tracing papers, also known as Varieties, some sub-varieties would be imitation parchment and glassine. And finally, parchment paper, um, mm, properly called vegetable parchment paper, or pergament. The cellulose, as we know as paper people, the cellulose that forms paper is actually a transparent material. The reason our sheets of paper appear opaque is because of the way light refracts from the fibers in the voids of the paper sheet. So to make the paper transparent, what we need to do is fill those voids and compact those fibers so more light will pass through the sheet rather than being reflected back at us. The oldest process is impregnation, uh, the oiled papers of Tanini and everybody since, which fills the voids between the paper fibers with an oil or resin that has optical properties similar to cellulose. Refractive index of about 1.5556. The materials most frequently chosen for this purpose were the natural resins such as Canada balsam, Damar, or oil of turpentine, the drying vegetable oils such as boiled linseed, poppy, or walnut, or even mineral oils such as cottonseed or castor. And since 1950, for the papers we now call vellum, synthetic resins. As the market increased for tracing papers during the 19th century, manufacturers sought to find oils and impregnants that did not darken and embrittle the paper or transfer to adjacent sheets. But they were really not completely successful to the introduction of acrylic resins in, after 1950. So it's important to remember that these oiled papers were not made by paper makers. These were a post-paper making conversion by another processor. Early on, the papers were brushed directly with oil or oil resin mixture, pressed or dried between um, absorbent supports. Then later on, they developed machines that could coat the paper by putting it through baths of oil and resin and then scraping it away with a doctor blade you know, very, very quickly. So they could make the papers very fast. One important part of the process was allowing the paper to mature since the oil had to oxidize. It didn't really dry. It actually is, of course, as we know, a chemical change. If it was done in a poor environment or it was poor quality oil, it be could become rancid and these papers were sometimes known for their odor. Mineral oils, of course, didn't dry. They also didn't become brittle, however, because they didn't form that um, rigid matrix within the paper fibers. Unfortunately, of course, they then continue to transfer that oil to adjacent papers. Um, some papers, particularly the earlier ones, are only oil, but many the great majority are an oil resin mixture. The resin increases the paper transparency more than oil does, but the oil imparts more flexibility. So most papers are some kind of a blend of the two. Then we have natural, also called unprepared tracing papers, 
And these were created by overbeating or hydrating the cellulose fibers in the beater before the sheet was formed. These heavily beaten fibers then collapse and actually somewhat gelatinize to fill those voids that would exist in an average sheet of paper. And then the paper is pressed to further com to compress the fibers and make sure that the voids are as full as possible. The earliest American reference to an unprepared or natural tracing paper for drafting that I've found is in a trade catalog of 1879. But it's very clear that these papers are the descendants of the banknote papers we saw early in the 19th century, which continued to be made and listed for tracing purposes in catalogs through the 19th and into the 20th century. Unlike the prepared papers we looked at, these natural papers were made in one continuous process by the paper maker, and they tended to be the least expensive of the options available. Modern machines, run at unlike this early one, run at great speeds with considerable tension in the machine direction as the papers are produced. These papers are difficult to make for paper makers. Um, as anybody knows who's made paper or worked with even handmade papers, the beading in many ways is the most critical element. We always think of the paper maker with the, um, you know, the mold and the decal and dipping, but if the pulp has not been properly prepared and is not the right dilution, um, you only end up with a lumpy sheet. It's much, much harder, as anybody who's made paper knows, to make a very fine smooth, thin sheet, which is what we're trying to make here. These pulps were known as very wet or slow pulps because they drain so slowly from the wire carrying the paper web. So paper makers had to install vacuum boxes that actually would help suck the water out of the paper as the web and the wire passed over them. They also came to very quickly to prefer um, sulfite processed wood pulps. Um, because these pulps swelled very readily, so they were easier to beat, they also liked having lots of hemicelluloses. While we all value, ah, the alpha cellulose, um, not people making these sorts of papers. Um, they wanted shorter fibers, they needed fibers that would hydrate and swell a lot. So here is uh, two sort of opposite ends of the natural paper, and this is from a uh, little book of samples that my workshop group is very familiar with, Alba, which was the very highest end for Kufel and Esser. And you can see over a dark background, it's transparent, translucent, but not highly so. And this vegetable tracing paper, rather similar to glassine, which is extremely transparent, also extremely reactive. If you put your hand under it, the humidity, the moisture coming from your hand immediately causes the paper to start to curl. And these uh, types of papers, I call them sort of extreme papers, um, like glassine, were produced, they weren't only heavily calendared to compress the fibers, they were super calendared which means that the paper web, while it still contained a significant amount of moisture, about 30%, went through rolls like this, um, which were highly heated, and it pressed the paper under great um, pressure. So we have both pressure and heat, and you can see the steam coming off of this example. Okay, always fun to see how these papers were marketed. I never can resist the trade catalogs. So here we are, prepared tracing paper you know, the oiled variety. Okay, it's transparent as glass, strong as parchment, permanent as papyrus, absolutely odorless. These prepared papers are white, capital W-H-I-T-E, in color, will not become yellow or brittle with age. So we see what the concerns were. Now here we are with Alba, our very high-end natural paper. And they're saying it's a natural, um, unprepared paper of high translucency, very thin yet strong, splendid erasing qualities, and just the right amount of tooth to its surface. Your pencil drawings on Alba will make good blueprints and are amply permanent to file for future reference. <laughs> 
So we can see what the concerns were of the people who were buying these papers. And here is sort of a typical comparison of a thin, you know, well-oiled paper and of a natural paper. Now, as my class knows, it's not always this simple to tell them apart. But it's nice to start with a clear comparison before we get more complicated. The final variety that we'll look at is parchment paper. Um, mm. And to form this paper, the sheet was subjected to brief immersion in sulfuric acid, reduced baths of reducing strength, followed by a neutralizing bath. So the acid gelatinizes the surface layer of the cellulose, which then fills in the voids between the remaining fibers, rendering the sheet translucent. And the result is a sheet that's quite strong and actually resembles parchment in its appearance and function. It has that crisp rattle that we associate with parchment and the same kind of strength. The earliest American reference I found a parchment paper as a drawing support is again in a different 1879 uh, trade catalog. Again, this was just as blueprinting was coming to the fore. Although the technique had been used since the 1860 to produce uh, papers for packaging foods and the process actually discovered a good deal before that, but it was pr protected by patents and not widely manufactured. Okay, originally, um, parchment, and this is the kind of machine that was developed for the paper web, and again, this was a, not done by the paper maker, this was a conversion post paper making, to take up two different baths of sulfuric acid and neutralizing uh, material before it was wound on that final roll. Originally, uh, paper makers used very good quality, unsized cotton water leaf to make parchment papers, but they unfortunately discovered they could use poor quality sheets. Um, parchment paper also, while the other papers have their issues as they're made, parchment paper shrinks about 30% during the manufacturing process, which is one reason it becomes such a dense, strong sheet. They also discovered they could do full or partial parchmentization, so the surface could be partially treated to resemble leather or ivory or other materials to get different properties. Okay, of course they didn't stick to just one process. We also find that we have purpose design papers, so manufacturers would use more than one process to make transparent papers. Uh, sort of probably not statistically significant analyses, but looking at a lot of papers, about 60% of parchment and natural papers also have at least a small amount of an added oil or resin. Modern parchment papers are often also heavily beaten, as are prepared papers. So they were combining these different processes. The paper may also be internally sized with alum, rosin, or starch which changes the way it reacts, surfacized with gelatin, starch, or wax. And they also commonly added plasticizers to help uh, maintain flexibility, often glycerin, grape sugar, or various salts that would attract and hold moisture within the paper sheet. So just a quick look at some scanning electron microscope images that gives you a sense of what these sheets look like on a much more micro scale. And to these I pay tribute to my colleague Diane van der Ryden in the years she worked at the Smithsonian. So we have a natural paper on the left and you can see that very compressed fibers and this one fiber here. And then glassine, its extreme cousin, almost no fibers are visible. Then parchment paper, remember we are gelatinizing the outer layer of the cellulose fibers, so they are really tending to want to adhere to each other. And with a prepared paper, we can clearly see um, the oil resin matrix um, that surrounds the paper fibers. <clears throat> so we've created these incredibly dense sheets with these heavily beaten fibers these heavily beaten fibers we know really want to absorb water. They absorb water much more readily than lightly beaten fibers. But 
we have these really dense sheets where there are no voids. Where are these expanding fibers going to go? There's only one place they can go, they distort. And this, of course, is one of the major problems we associate with these papers. Here in this uh, uh, drawing in a um, scrapbook, a sketchbook at Winnetor, you see they put a ink wash down one side of the building. And because that was damp, it restrained. The other area had to adjust to the expansion there, and it did so by distorting and cockling. We can also induce pretty extreme cockling, as you see on the left, where we have a wet sheet, a sheet where the, um, <clears throat> the outside of the sheet was dried first, and then a sheet where the inside was dried first. Um, so this is the dual nature of, part of these transparent papers. They really, really, really need to be able to expand and react to moisture, but they're so dense they have a very hard time doing it. So now that we know more of the history and technology of manufacture, what do we do with them? Especially when we find them like this. Large quantities, large sizes, rolled, torn, tattered, folded in pieces, crumpled, repaired. Um, conservators have developed special techniques of mending, lining, and flattening, um, about which you will hear much more in the following talks. We can do a lot, but our treatment efforts will really only touch a small fraction of the huge quantities of these drawings in our collection, which leaves us with preventive conservation is really our only viable option. Beyond environment, it comes to handling and storage. Handling is often the single greatest threat. A brittle rolled drawing lying quietly and peacefully on a shelf is not getting any worse until someone tries to unroll it or until somebody puts something on top of it. So being able to protect these drawings from handling becomes in many instances the primary means of preservation. But of course we can't provide optimum protection let alone treatment for everything. So the priorities are often established by use. <clears throat> which collections, which drawings are going to be used and handled the most? For many, rolled storage and even folded storage is fine. Some have luxury housing, flat files, wonderful rolled storage on the left. Others of us are very lucky and very happy to have just regular industrial shelving that will hold rolls and boxes carefully arranged and stacked. I work with one collection with a huge, huge collection. And as they get drawing sets, they have um, arranged to have a manufacturer make polyethylene bags, you know, sort of like the Ziploc bags that we use for sandwiches, but very long and thin. They put each drawing set rolled in one of these bags, close it, label it, and put them on closely spaced shelves. And that's their first step to protect their drawings. So nobody's unrolling them at that point. There's nothing on top of them. Until somebody wants to use them, they're really quite safe. So obviously efficient storage is something we, because these collections are so huge, we all have to look at. Uh, it's always wonderful you know, to have these compact storage units. And vendors have figured out ways to incorporate all kinds of files and everything in them to accommodate the different kinds of drawing formats. Um, some of us uh, just go ahead and divide flat file drawers into standard sizes to make storage more efficient when we have, actually have smaller drawings. Um, here is a, what I find to be a really inventive and very efficient means of rolled storage where each drawing set is rolled around a uh, core tube and then placed in a larger tube arranged like honeycombs and then the end cap can be labeled. And this is something that was done in the library at the University of Syracuse um, and provides a really um, efficient way of storing drawings rolled. Okay, I also think we have to find alternatives to treatment for badly damaged drawings that are going to be used. Um, treatment is invasive, 
and it's time consuming and in many cases changes the fundamental nature of the sheet. However, if we can put them in a simple polyester film folder, we know that it will provide a great deal of protection and often means we don't have to mend the tears or mend all of them. Uh, storing them between polyester sheets allows researchers to see them uh, and handle them safely with really minimal treatment. I also, one of my favorite means of storage is to take a piece of folder stock of the appropriate size and attach a sheet of polyester film to it with a double-sided tape and then insert a piece of white sewing thread next to that tape so the drawing cannot slide into it. These can be labeled. They slip in and out of flat file draw drawers like a, we say, a hot knife through butter. And it means that as long as the drawing is reasonably flat, no further treatment is needed. Handling, as I said, is also absolutely critical to preservation. Here we're using a rigid board to lift folders out of a drawer to get to the drawings below. We know in understaffed libraries it is a great temptation to use what I call the uh, lift and jerk means of retrieval for a drawing in a folder, not to mention the refiling accomplished by stuffing it back in. If we don't have landing spaces, to put folders and we don't take the time to lift them and put drawings in folders carefully, we will keep sustaining more and more damage. Also moving drawings. Why, why, why do they put flat files in the back of library and archival stacks accessible only by narrow aisles? Um, I know that is the case at Winneter and we have this cart which our wood shop built, which allows us for the flexible enough drawings to transport them in this manner up and down the aisles rather than trying to carry them like this. Uh, another institution has a much prettier cart. They obviously have wider aisles, but the principle remains the same. We need a safe way to take them from storage to the reading room. So, with that, we come to the end of this brief exploration of this really remarkable material that's been critical to building the infrastructure, really, of the modern world, including Mexico City. Talk about an amazing infrastructure. So we've seen everything from the mundane to the masterpieces. It supports everything from quick ephemeral sketches to plans and renderings for skyscrapers, to whimsical drawings for Tudor cottages. And it deserves our profound respect and careful attention. And I thank you all for yours. Muchas gracias, Luis. Thank you very much. Si hay tiempo de preguntas, entonces permítanme que por Okay. Yeah, let's see. It's just, uh, if okay. you need more volume, just right. put in the two. Okay. Okay. Questions? Yes. I can English, English or Spanish, either. When did this concern for these kind of papers start? I mean, as professionals of conservation around here, they started being interested in these kind of drawings at some point. When did this real research work preserving these kind of drawings started? Okay, well, I can um, speak more to my own experience in my experience in the U.S. Um, I was working in a regional center in the 1980s and 1990s in Philadelphia, 
And our regional center is a um, organization that takes work from many different um, institutions and also provides educational programs and surveys and so on. And in the late uh, 1980s, we started seeing a lot of architectural drawings coming into our laboratory. Um, not only from two major collections in the city of Philadelphia, but also from historical societies um, and libraries and archives. There was one historical society that had a huge collection of drawings and they had run out of space. And one, they were, one way they stored them was to take clothes pins in a hanger and accordion them back and forth and hang them in a closet. Um, another institution was storing them, uh, it was a historical society, in a Conestoga wagon, one of the covered wagons we see in westerns that they had on exhibit. Uh, and so they came to our laboratory and because most of my work was with library and archives rather than art on paper, they came to me. And, you know, drawings on tracing paper, beautiful renderings, blueprints, all kinds of photo reproductive processes. And I quickly realized that I really didn't understand them, that I didn't know enough about them to treat them responsibly. So I said, well, you know, I will go, you know, do some research and look them up. And I went and I looked at all the secondary sources and I, did, I couldn't find anything. It was very little. There were a few, you know, minor articles about one aspect or another, but not enough to really guide me. And so that's how I began. Um, I got some leave time to go do some research, and then I got some grants to give me more leave time to go look at lots of collections and go to different libraries. And first I was, oh, I'll just publish an article, and it just kept growing. So I can say for us in the late 1880s, they started to become, you know, I always say follow the money. We started seeing higher auction prices for really nice drawings. We started seeing more institutions actively collecting drawings. So that's when they really came more and more to the attention of conservators. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Luis. Y bueno, los invitamos a tomar un receso de 15 minutos. Nos vamos aquí, nos vamos a las 10:20, por favor, para comenzar con nuestra mesa. Gracias.